Welcome to this presentation. It is, this is our uh, sixth presentation on Chapter 5, which is the chapter about pleadings. Um, in this uh, PowerPoint presentation, we're going to cover kind of the second half of the pleading section. We're going to focus upon the defendant. You'll find the uh, slides that I'm going to be using here in the Part 2 group of slides for this particular chapter. So let's get started. Okay, so we've been focusing upon the plaintiff. Now we're going to switch gears and think about pleadings from the perspective of the defendant. Um, the first question, of course, that the defendant is probably thinking about when he's sued is, what do I have to do next? And one of the essential parts of that is going to be figuring out how long the defendant has in order to file uh, the matter. And you can see we'll find in uh, rule 12 the time period. So let's go ahead and look at that rule for a second so we can see exactly how that works. So we're going to go to rules. We're going to go back to rule 12. Time to serve a response of pleading. In general, unless another time is specified by this rule or federal statute, the time for serving a response of pleading, and what is a response of pleading? Well, it's simply going to be an answer, is as follows. A defendant must serve an answer within 21 days after being served with a summons and complaint or if it is timely waived service under Rule uh, 4B within 60 days after the request for the waive of service is sent or within um, 90 days after it is sent to the defendant outside of any judicial uh, in district of the United States. You may recall we were talking about waiver and I said, you know, I'm going to tell you more about this later. Um, and so now I'm going to tell you more about this. Um, you may have, have recalled we were talking about, well, uh, why should the defendant waive service or process? This is, of course, one of the big reasons is, as we talked about, um, creating goodwill. Another reason would be uh, that this would become a court cost, the cost of service, and so it makes sense to keep the court cost as low as possible because you might end up paying it. But this is perhaps one of the biggest reasons that go people waive service, and that is that instead of having only 21 days to file your lawsuit, you now get 60 days from the date that the request for the waiver was sent. Um, so that means that you, it, if the day that the request was sent was actually the day that you got served, that means you have 39 more days. Now, obviously, the um, plaintiff isn't going to serve you the same day that he sends a request for waiver of service, but he probably can serve you pretty darn quickly after that if it appears that you're not going to accept the waiver. So this can give you a little bit more time to think about the, the case and to develop strategies if you go ahead and waive service. If you don't waive service, you're back to the 21 days, uh, three weeks essentially from that perspective. Okay, so let's um, go back to our uh, slideshow. So again, these are the, the two rules or the, the two options that exist. And again, it's whichever um, applies if waiver is not uh, done or if waiver is done. We have the two periods of time. How do we calculate those periods of time? Well, this is a rule that is true really for any date establishment within the federal rules. The date of the event we count as day zero. It is not day one. The day after the event is day one. We're going to count every day, including Saturdays and Sundays, any type of legal holidays. The only time we don't count a day after day one is when it is the last day. If the last day in the cycle is a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday, then we keep on skipping ahead until we get to the next day that the courthouse is open. So let's say that um, the, the last day of the period would ordinarily be a date that happens to be a Saturday. Okay, well, we can't file things in the court on Saturday, so then we go ahead to the Sunday. Well, we can't file things on Sunday, so then we leap ahead to the Monday. But let's say the Monday was a legal holiday. We can't do anything on the Monday, so then we're on the Tuesday date. That's how you, you keep on going forward. However, let's say that um, the last day of the period happens to be a Tuesday, which is not a, a legal holiday. 
we don't go back and start saying, well, gosh, there were a lot of Saturdays and Sundays and legal holidays that happened in the interim. Doesn't matter. The only time the legal holiday matters is when it's the last day. It doesn't matter if it's day zero. It doesn't matter if it's day one. It doesn't matter if it's all the way up to the day before the day that it's due. The only time that a Saturday or Sunday legal holiday matters is when it is the day that that uh, deadline would ordinarily occur. Um, so how do we calculate when the deadline for the last day is? For e-filing purposes, it's midnight in the court's time zone. So this is, um, uh, you know, I guess you could say 11, 59 p.m. Now, if you're filing a case in, let's say you're in central time zone and the court is in eastern time zone, well, guess what? It's an hour later there. So really in your time zone, the time would be 10.59 p.m. Um, of course, if you're filing something in the mountain time zone, then you have an extra hour. Um, Sometimes students get frustrated when um, professors in this uh, program aren't very flexible about deadlines. And this is one of the reasons courts aren't flexible about deadlines. If I file it at 12.01 a.m. of the next morning, the court has no compassion, has no interest whatsoever in the fact that you were just one minute late um, when it comes to a deadline that matters. Um, generally speaking, that's just the deal. You're late. Um, and so one of the reasons that we typically are a little bit uh, uh, prickly, a little bit precise about the, the de deadlines is that this is a time you can afford to miss a deadline. Um, nobody's going to see you for malpractice. You're not going to get fired for it. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're not thrilled with your grade. Um, you know, you get a zero on that particular assignment. In most cases, you can rebound and you may not even lose a letter grade as a result of the error. It's pretty much of a cost-free experience. There's just a little bit of pain associated with it, again, to reinforce the fact that in this area of life, deadlines really, really do matter. And so it can kind of help get you started in that process. I would say in most legal professionals career, there will be a, a moment where you miss a deadline. It is traumatic. Hopefully that never happens to you. It did happen to me and it was incredibly, incredibly stressful. Uh, know that any assignment you miss in this course or any other course, the stress level is so small in comparison. And if you're experiencing some stress because of a missed deadline, Think to yourself, oh my gosh, how much more terrible this would have been if I had been fired or if my client had lost some um, avenue of relief that it otherwise would have had. Um, it's, it's really a necessary part of that process to get used to thinking about deadlines as really, really being deadlines. Um, unfortunately, in the practice of law, many times we are up against a pretty hard deadline that isn't really our fault. The client doesn't tell us about a particular matter until we're just on the eve of when the deadline is due or other things can come up. So it's not unusual for legal professionals to be right up against that deadline. The wonderful thing about being a student is there's really no reason to ever be hard up against a deadline. Um, if something is due at Sunday at 11.59 p.m., my words of advice are just treat it as if the deadline were 24 hours earlier or even 48 hours earlier. And that gives you plenty of time if there's technical difficulties or other issues. Um, I would never play around with the last several hours before an assignment was due because things happen. The computers crash, um, uh, the internet goes down, Canvas doesn't work appropriately. Um, the court wouldn't be interested in those excuses, and so they're not likely to be very persuasive to your um, uh, teacher. So just treat it as if the deadline was actually significantly in advance, and that way you don't have to worry about it. I wish I could give you that piece of advice when you're in practice. Unfortunately, many times the, the legal professional isn't sufficiently in control of the situation to, to guarantee against that uh, situation. 
Okay. Um, if we're not filing electronically, and you're going to fi find that almost always you're going to be filing electronically, um, but uh, otherwise it's going to be when the clerk's office closes. Um, and again, we'll, you can find the specific deadlines here. Let's just go ahead and flip to it so we can see. It's 6A4. Oops, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Six A four. Last day to find, unless a different time is set by statute, local rule, or court order, the last day ends for electronic filing at midnight in the court's time zone, and by filing by other means when the court's office is scheduled to close. Let's just see what the local rules in the Eastern District are on this issue, if there are any. Don't know that there are. Here, deficient or corrected documents. When a document is corrected or refiled by an attorney following a deficiency notice from the clerk's office, example, for a missing certificate of service or certificate of con conference, the time for filing a response runs from the filing of the corrected or refiled notice, not the original document. So that doesn't really uh, give us a lot of helpful information for establishing the deadline uh, for this purpose. But again, that's an interesting rule to keep in mind. Okay. So let's go forward. So again, if, if uh, this would be an example of how it might proceed, let's just kind of play the game here. So we get served on this date. This is day zero. This will be one, two, three, four. This is a Saturday, but we're still counting it. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, still counts even though that might be a court holiday, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So this would be the date that our answer is due. But let's trick things up a little bit. And let's say that it didn't happen on the first. We weren't served on the first. We were instead served on the third. So I'm going to go ahead and, and clear the annotations. OK, and we're going to go forward and do it here. So this is the day of the event. This is day zero. We have one, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 21, Thanksgiving. Is the courthouse going to be open on that date? No. So now we have to look to the Friday date. Now we're going to have to check the local rules or the federal rules and then the local rules to see is the day after Thanksgiving a court holiday? Not sure. We're going to discard this, but we'll, we'll, we'll want to go back and remember that this is the date we're not sure about. Okay, so let's look at our rules. First of all, I'm going to go to the to the main rules. So here's our legal holiday section. We're in rule 6A6. The date set aside for statute for observing these days. Now you can see Thanksgiving Day is on the list, but there is no day for the day after Thanksgiving. It could be any day declared a holiday by the President or Congress. and um, any other day declared a holiday by the state where the district court is located. Let's just look at the local rules to see if we have anything here. There is nothing here. So we're going to work under the assumption that the day after is not a holiday. 
And so, and again, usually you'd be able to call contact the court and say, hey, are y'all open on that day? Let's assume that they are open that day, so this would be the date that our answer would be due under those circumstances. Now, this whole process um, is what the, the paralegal typically does. The paralegal gets the, uh, the lawsuit and then calculates the due date. Um, the other side is not required to tell you when the due date is. Um, you do the calculation yourself, and so it's important that you know how to do this calculation. It's important you not mess up, obviously. It's a big deal. And so you're going to calendar this date, the 25th, once you feel good that this is the date. But of course, you can't just go to work on the 25th and say, okay, I'm gonna start on the answer. You will have had to have thought about it well in advance after all. Are the people of your defendant, your client's business gonna be probably at work on the day after Thanksgiving? No, they may not be at work all of this week. And you may have questions that take several days to answer and we'll see how involved that process can be. So when you get served on the 3rd, you're probably going to want to start researching this, uh, certainly by the 7th. You're going to want to start working with the client to figure out these ins and outs. Um, th and this assumes that the client has already hired you. Sometimes the client you know, shops around for counsel and you might not even get the call until the 14th. So you don't really have a lot of time. So don't think, oh, well, I can wait till the 25th or I can wait till the 23rd. No, you really can't. Filing an answer requires sometimes a very significant amount of research. Okay, so what are your options to the defendant? You've been served or you waive, waive service, you figured out what your due date is, and now you have to decide what you're going to do. You've got two choices. One is to file an answer, which is the usual choice. Um, I'm going to ballpark here and guess probably about 90% of the time the uh, defendant files an answer. But that's not the only choice the defendant has. The defendant can also, or excuse me, alternatively file a motion and not file an answer at that time. And when a motion is filed, these are called 12B motions. And we'll go and look at, at uh, the Rule 12B in a couple minutes and see how that works. But examples of those types of motions would be a motion to strike or a motion for a more definite statement or a motion to dismiss. And again, there's several different categories under this. Obviously, in order to file all these motions, you have to have a legal basis for it. Um, and obviously, sometimes people, reasonable minds can sometimes differ about whether you have a basis. Obviously, if you don't have a basis, you're going to go ahead and file the answer. You might even file the answer if you have a legal basis, because you might decide, you know what, we could go through the actions of filing this motion and then the other side could respond and back and forth and back and forth. But, and sometimes that's what the client wants, but sometimes the client says, you know what, uh, is this going to help us in the long run or is this just going to run up our legal bills? And sometimes the client says, no, okay, yeah, I get it that we'd probably win this motion and they'd probably have to redraft their, their um, complaint and that would be with scoring a point against them but we didn't end up spending a lot of fees and really we're not getting out of the lawsuit as a result of it. So depending upon uh, the basis for the motion that you might be able to file and what its outcome is likely to be, the client may well say, no, we're passing on that. We want to go ahead and file an answer. But we're going to look at that, the, 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 the 12 B motions that uh, can be filed and, and see kind of what those look like, what the advantages and disadvantages of those might be. Okay, so one is a motion for a more definite statement. That is actually a 12 E motion. Let's just go and look at the uh, Rule 12 uh, options. Uh, I, I think I said before, you have to know Rule 11. Rule 23 is a very common rule to know. Uh, probably the other one that competes with it in terms of fame is Rule 12. That's a very common rule to know. You aren't required to know it for this class, but it is a, a you will constantly hear people talk about uh, 12B, 12E. Let's scroll down. So we're in Rule 12. We're going A, B, C, D, E, and you can see motion for a more definite statement. A party may move for a more definite statement of a pleading in which a responsive pleading is allowed, but which is so vague and ambiguous that the party cannot reasonably prepare a response. The motion must be made before filing a responsive pleading and must point out the defects complained of and the details desired. 
If the court orders a more definite statement and the order is not obeyed within 14 days after notice of the order or within the time the court sets, the court may strike the pleading or issue any other appropriate order. Of course, if the pleading is struck, then the lawsuit is dismissed, but it's dismissed without prejudice. So imagine that I file a lawsuit against Bob and, and you know, I have a lovely caption, I have a lovely section that talks about jurisdiction, and then I say, Bob was mean to me, and that's the facts that I allege. Well, that, I mean, gosh, uh, that doesn't state a claim. You can be mean to people without doing, uh, committing a tort or some other uh, colorable claim again that, that may exist. Um, and there's no specifics. I mean, did Bob say something mean? Did he write something mean about me? Did he hit me? Did he, were we in a car accident? I mean, what, 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 what are the facts of that circumstance? Like, this would be a classic situation for a motion for a more definite statement. The idea behind a motion for a more definite statement is that the defendant is really in a pickle. He can't really answer because, gosh, how do you deny or admit he was mean? Well, what particular event are you talking about? How do I know if I was mean or not since I don't know which event you're talking about? So that's the, the reason that you can't really file an answer. It's kind of mysterious what's being discussed. And so you may not know all the defenses and other things that you might want to advance. So that's a 12 E motion. And you can see why you have to file this before you file your answer, because if you do file an answer, then basically you're saying, well, I don't need a, I don't need a more definite statement because after all, I was able to file an answer. So you, really, you're just going to file a motion for a de more definite statement when it, you feel like it's impossible to file an answer because you just don't know what's going on here. Let's look at another option, which is a 12F, which is a motion to strike. Let's go back and look at this for a second. So we're now we're going down to 12F. This is a motion to strike. The court, let me pop like that. The court may strike from a pleading an insufficient defense or any redundant, immaterial, impertinent, or scandalous matter. I love this language. The court may on its own or on motion by a party either before responding to the pleading or if a response is not allowed within uh, 21 days after being served with a pleading. So let's say that um, there was profanity in the pleading, not quoting somebody using profanity, but the person filing it uh, called me a, a, a racial epithet or um, uh, used profanity in the document. Well, that would certainly be impertinent and scandalous. And so under those circumstances, that would be, that part of the complaint could be struck. But I'm going to have to move. Of course, the court could on its own, but more likely the court's going to wait for me to object to it in order to move that issue along. And just like with the motion for a more definite statement, I'm going to need to file this motion before I file my answer. Now we're up to the 12B motions, and this is the, the, the heart of, of this practice. Let's go back and look at 12B. So we're up here on 12B. Here are the defenses. Every defense to a claim for relief in any pleading must be asserted in the responsive pleading if one is required. But a party may assert the following defenses by motion. So if you're saying there's a lack of subject matter jurisdiction or a lack of personal jurisdiction or a lack or improper venue or insufficient process, meaning that the, uh, the process server did not correctly serve or insufficient service of process. So I guess this would be a, an issue about the, uh, the summons, or a failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, or failure to join a party under Rule 19. I will tell you 12B6 is the rock star of this group. It's by far the most commonly used. Um, going back to, the, to this one, uh, well, actually not that one, this one right here, 12B2, um, it's really important that you file a 12B2 before you file your answer. And we call this, historically, the term for it would have been a special appearance. You don't actually use those terms in federal court anymore, but it's what people are thinking about. That's the, the yeah. idea that they have in their head when they talk about this. Um, and, and that is that if you file your answer first and then you complain either in your answer or in a separately filed document about personal jurisdiction, uh, saying the court did not have personal jurisdiction over you, the defendant, guess what? 
you waived it because an answer is a general appearance. By submitting your answer, you are waiving any objections to that. So it's really important if you're complaining about personal jurisdiction to go ahead and do that through a 12B2 motion before you file your answer. Some of these others, you may still have those claims if you file an answer first, but the general rule of thumb is people want to file a 12 uh, a, a, a rule 12 motion before they file the answer just so they can make sure that they've preserved all the particulars of their issue because filing the answer can waive some of them. Okay so again here are some examples. I've already read them but a lack of subject matter jurisdiction, lack of personal jurisdiction, or again the rock star 12b6, failure to stay to claim upon which relief can be granted. Let me give you an example of this one. Um, let's say that I am uh, suing Bob. Bob and I were in a car accident. Um, Bob was at the red light minding his own business. I was on my phone not paying good attention. I ran into the back of Bob's car as he waited at the red light. Um, the front uh, fender of my car was bent and I was injured in the accident. Um, I sue Bob in my recitation of facts. I said just those facts as they happened. Well, Bob would likely file a 12B6 motion saying, well, no, wait a second. Let's just assume everything Gruber said is how it happened. Well, I did nothing wrong according to her account. It was a red light. Of course, I'm stopped at the red light. Uh, she was the one who was doing the irresponsible thing. And uh, Bob would be right. Very likely, Bob would be granted a... a, a, a uh, his motion and the lawsuit would be dismissed, possibly in that case with prejudice. But there could be other cases that, let me give another example. Let's say that I were to say, well, uh, the light wasn't really red. Bob just randomly stopped at a green light. And so because his car stopped, I, I hit his car. And that's, uh, so he is responsible for the car accident. Well, it's Bob's position, the light was red and then of course he had to stop at the light. Um, so we have a factual difference. Well, you don't resolve those with a, a 12B motion because that is a question for the jury to resolve, not for the judge to resolve. So when you file a 12B6, you're saying, given the facts as alleged by the plaintiff in the uh, lawsuit, it's not possible for the plaintiff to win. You're not actually having to concede those facts for the long haul, but for the purpose of this motion you did, you do. And that's the basis for this. Um, it's a way to hopefully get yourself out of the lawsuit sooner rather than later. Obviously, if you can get out sooner, you're saving yourself attorney's fees. And then again, here are some of the, the bases for, for um, how you can get out of, out of it. Now, if it is a problem that is curable, fixable by the plaintiff, then they will be dismissed without prejudice. So for example, improper venue, filed in the wrong federal court, all the plaintiff has to do is refile in the right court, he can proceed with his lawsuit. This obviously is another thing that can be corrected, this can be corrected, and this can be corrected, as can this. Um, Sometimes courts will give the opportunity to cure before they dismiss the lawsuit. But even if they don't dismiss, it will be dismissal without prejudice. If the improper venue, the court doesn't have to dismiss it, can simply transfer it to a better place or, or court that would have a proper venue under those circumstances. Okay. Um, you get one shot at the... Uh, uh, 12 rule 12 motion so you have to list all of your bases in that one motion if you forget one for example you move for a 12b6 but you don't move for a more definite statement a 12e then you've waived the one that you haven't advanced um, of course you can't waive um, certain things for example you can never waive subject matter jurisdiction um, and here are three others that two others that you can't waive as well. So most of them you, you can waive if you don't assert your rights um, at the beginning of the, of the matter, but these um, can be asserted later on. These are exceptions to that rule. If um, you lose your 12B motion, if the court denies it, then um, you have 14 days. I apologize, let me just go ahead and here. I left that one there. Sorry about that. There we go. 
within 14 days after the notice of the court's action. So um, if, if you aren't sure that your motion is going to prevail, and you usually aren't, you're probably already working on your answer to some extent. Um, now, obviously, you know, if you file your um, 12B motion on this day, the court's ruling might take a while. And so this is when you file the motion, and this is when you get the order denying your motion, and then your answer will be due, we'll say in 14 days right here. And again, if it's a court holiday, this, the same computation process applies. So it might be, you know, if this is a Saturday, it might be a, uh, or more likely a court holiday, it might be a little bit later before the actual due date. But most time it's gonna be the 14 days. Here we go. Okay, so here are the various rules, and this kind of gives you a checklist. You don't waive this one. You don't waive uh, 12B6. You don't waive joinder. Um, but the other ones you do waive if you don't advance them um, in your first file document. So if you file an answer first before you file, file a Rule 12 motion. Okay, so we've talked about 12B motions now, right, not just 12B, but, but 12, Rule 12 motions generally. Now we're going to look at the answer. This is the key document. I mean, Rule 12 motions are cool and awesome, and you're going to definitely file some if you have a federal practice, but your bread and butter is going to be the answer. So let's focus on that now. Um, the answer is usually quite a bit harder to file than the, um, the Rule 12 motion. And I'll be honest with you, have there been times in people's practice where they filed uh, a Rule 12 motion maybe that wasn't 100% meritorious because they weren't ready to file the answer and it was a way to buy a little extra time? Um, I'm sure it's happened a time or two. It's not prob probably the most ethical path. To, to file. There are some Rule 11 problems with that, so you don't want to abuse that, but it, it certainly has happened in recorded history for sure. Okay, so let's look at what an answer is. Well, an answer is the defendant's written response to the plaintiff's complaint. So obviously it's written and it's going to respond to all the things in the complaint. And what's going to happen is the defendant has to admit or deny every single allegation in the complaint. Also, the defendant has to assert any affirmative defenses or can waive them. And again, if you don't have a separate document that you filed with your Rule 12 defenses, you can put them in your answer. So those are kind of a starting point, some overview of what you want to think about when you think about an answer. So here we have our caption again. We have our same style. Everything above this line is identical to what we saw in our complaint. Nothing new here. Um, everything below is going to be new. So we have our name. Remember the, the three naming things. We have who is filing it, uh, what is the order of this particular filing, and what is the name of the document. So we know here the defendant, Bandon, is filing this. It's an answer. Oh, and this is the first answer filed. Um, so we're going to say original answer. By the way, this is likely to be the name that's going to be in the footer of the document as well. And this court, I mean, this particular attorney is started to the honorable judge of the court. Defendant Bird D. Um, Bandit files this original answer to plaintiff uh, Buford T. Justice's original complaint. Very common way to get, get the document started. You can see we have the jury in here. This doesn't mean that um, Mr. Bandit wants a jury trial. As we said before, plaintiffs really want jury trials. Typically, defendants don't, although that's not always the case. But the continuation of the word jury here isn't to reflect Bandit's interest in a jury, but it's to reflect the fact that Justice has requested a jury trial. Now, if Justice hadn't requested a jury trial and Bandit is going to request a jury trial through his answer, which he can do, then he would be putting the jury a notice right here at this time. Okay, so let's talk about the bread and butter of a, an answer. An answer is pretty different than a um, complaint. A complaint tells a lovely story, you can get into it, 
uh, understand what's happening. There's a little bit of drama. Uh, a, an answer is a pretty boring document. It is much less uh, story oriented. If you've practiced in a Texas state court, you're familiar with something called a general denial. That's usually what you file in Texas um, as your answer if you're a defendant. We do not have that in federal court. So if you have some experience with state court, forget what you learn about how you do things in state court because how you do things in federal court is appreciably different. The name is the same. We call it an answer in both places. Um, but it's a fundamentally different process that we're going to follow. Okay, so you have to go through and admit and deny every single solitary allegation in the complaint. Um, it's not unusual, in fact, that because the process of admitting and denying every single fact, your answer can actually be longer than the original complaint. Um, not always the case, but it's usually not a ton shorter than the original complaint um, because you have to go through each, each element. That's a different for most of us in our practice experience if we practice in Texas state court. Typically, answers in Texas state courts are pretty short documents. I'm not going to go through the ins and outs of it because I don't want you to get confused. Um, you'll cover that in Texas civil litigation at some future date. Okay, so we call the denial of an allegation, we call it a specific denial. When we deny something in federal court, we are not saying, gosh, we want you to have to prove that. We aren't going to let you off the hook and just concede that fact because we're nice guys. We're going to make you work for it. I mean, it might end up that what you're saying there is true. It might end up that it's not. Um, but right now we're going to deny it. That is not an option in federal court. If you know a fact is true, you have to admit it. Even if you very much wish that fact were not true, you have to admit it. In addition, it's not good enough for you to say, well, I don't think it's true, and so I'm going to deny it. No, you actually have to investigate it to see if it's true. You have a duty, a Rule 11 duty, to actually look into it. You can't just say, I hope that's false, and right now I don't know that it's true or false, so I'm just going to say false. Uh -uh, that's not good enough. Now, it, it is okay that, you know, certainly we haven't had a discovery, so you may not legitimately know whether it's true or false, and you can't always find out. And so it is appropriate sometimes to deny things that you ultimately are going to have to admit is true, but right now at this time, you, you appropriately can deny it. So those are your two options, to admit or to deny. But there is a third option. I don't think it's actually listed in the rules. Let me go back and, and uh, look at the rule for just a second so we can get a little refresher on this. Um, let's see here. It's uh, right. Let's see. Uh, here. Uh, in general, in responding to a pleading, a party must um, state in short and plain terms its defenses to each claim asserted against it, and and here's the part we're focusing on: admit or deny the allegations asserted against it by the op opposing party. So you have to go through each line of the document and admit or deny. So those are the, these are the two options that are stated in the rules, but I will tell you that those two options are not the whole game. There is a third option that we have that isn't, it should not be overused, but it's definitely something that is appropriate to use from time to time. And that is to say that you lack sufficient knowledge to admit or to deny it. I mean, after all, if you're not sure whether it's true or not, you don't want to admit it, and then it ends up being false, because once you admit it, there's no going back. It is admitted for all time. Um, it doesn't matter how strong the facts are that you later discover. So you definitely want to, you know, your temptation is to err on the side of deny. But again, if you have, um, if you lack a good faith basis for denying it, then what you can do is you can say, and typically the way people say it is, they lack sufficient knowledge to admit or to deny the information, and therefore they deny it. 
but they've given themselves some wiggle room. They're, they're saying, look, you know, I'm not saying for sure. I'm just saying, I don't know. And therefore, when you say, I don't know, you're having the effect of a denial. But most people will actually say, and therefore I deny it. Now, you'll see in, in complaints, paragraphs are typically rather short, but there can be many, many allegations in a particular, even in a particular sentence or a particular clause, and you have to unpack each one of those allegations. I mean, there might be, even in, in one sentence, seven or eight different factual allegations. Some of those you might have to admit to, some of those you might be able to deny, some of which you may not have a sufficient knowledge to admit or to deny. And so you have to really parse the, that particular language and sort through and see which ones you can admit and which ones you can deny. So here is an example of how you might approach uh, these admissions and denials. And again, the paragraph numbers are going to match up. So paragraph one is going to match paragraph one in the complaint. And paragraph two is going to match paragraph two in the complaint. Let's see how this particular attorney has worded the language. Bandit does not have sufficient knowledge or belief to respond to the allegations or statements in paragraph one of plaintiff's original complaint and therefore denies these allegations or statements. This is a classic good example of a insufficient knowledge denial. And again, there's no reason to rewrite or reinvent the wheel. Uh, find some language that you like. Doesn't have to be this one, but something similar, and that's what you're going to use in every paragraph. You don't have to, you know, vary the language. Um, you, this is not a creative writing exercise. This is not anything along those lines. In fact, almost always the attorney will have word for word the same language again and again. Let's look at an admission. We have that in number two. Defendant admits the allegations or statements in paragraph two of plaintiff's original complaint. Um, in this case, in this example, uh, the defendant is admitting every single allegation in paragraph two. Since this is usually the, the description of the parties, it's not surprising. But if we were in the factual section, it's fairly unusual that you would admit every single allegation in a paragraph, although it certainly happens. Um, more commonly, you're, again, you're going to parse it. You're going to have certain facts you admit, certain facts you deny, certain facts you lack a particular knowledge on. And we'll see that in paragraph six. A bandit admits his truck struck justice's vehicle, but bandit denies the remaining allegations or statements in this paragraph. So you can see he's parsed the allegations. And this is a pretty effective um, answer from that perspective. Okay, so let's see how we're going to respond to that incorporation by reference. You may recall that when you get to the causes of action, you, you, partic you often will say, we're incorporating by reference these particular paragraphs into this section. Well, again, you're going to use that same language. Uh, so this is how the, the complaint might be written. This is how the answer might say might handle this. So the complaint says, justice incorporates by references the facts set forth in section three above as if they were set forth verbatim. And then here's our answer to that. This is Bandit's answer. In answer to paragraph seven of plaintiff's complaint, I probably would have capitalized this, in which justice incorporates by reference certain paragraphs of uh, a chap section seven of the complaint, Defendant admits, denies, or alleges to the same effect in the same manner as defendant admitted, denied, or alleged in those specific paragraphs previously stated in this answer. Okay, again, this would be another uh, example of a paragraph you're probably going to have in your back pocket so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and come up with this wording again. Nothing in the world wrong with reusing this language several, several times in the docket. Nothing in the world wrong with taking this paragraph from somebody else's answer. You might shop around and find language that you like. There's no duty to um, uh, you know, cite that particular uh, style or, or way of putting that language in. It's very, very common to cut and paste from another answer, yours or someone else's under these circumstances. Okay, so let's uh, think about some cautions that we have. One thing that's important is to go through every single solitary word in the complaint. It is very easy to miss a single allegation. The way that I do it, let me just flip on over and look at a complaint that we have. Uh, let's use 
the Jackson v. Um, uh, Frisco ISD. What I would literally do in this situation is as I am answering, I would go through and say, okay, am I disputing that Alvin Jackson is the plaintiff? No. Am I disputing that he's a resident of the state of Texas? No. So I'm going to admit everything in this paragraph. Am I disputing that Frisco Independent School District is the defendant? Well, no. Am I disputing it as a, keep in mind, I'm the Frisco Independent School District in this case. Am I disputing as a school district organized under the laws of the state of Texas? Doesn't seem likely. Am I disputing that Frisco ISD may be served with citation? Again, that's a term with for summons. Um, so that, that actually, you might well deny this because it should have been citation. I'm assuming it should have been summons. Um, including a copy of this complaint by serving the DISD superintendent of schools. Again, I would deny this because now it's Jeremy Lyons. Um, this address is still good. And so uh, usually in the parties paragraph, there's not anything that you're going to be able to deny, but I've already identified uh, two things that I might deny under these circumstances. You have to go through with a fine tooth comb looking at each one of these allegations and you either have to have an admit or a deny associated with them. So probably the way I would respond to this one is I would say Frisco Independent School District denies that um, Frisco Independent School District may be served with a citation in this case because this matter is filed in federal court, period. Frisco Independent School District also denies that Rick Reedy is its um, superintendent of schools and that, it, he, that the complaints can be served upon him in that capacity, period. Then I'd say Frisco Independent School District admits any remaining allegations in the paragraph or something like that. Now, I'll tell you the more common way to write um, an, a, an admission slash denial paragraph is to say the things that you admit and say, you know, we admit that Frisco Independent School District is a defendant. We admit that it is a school district organized under state laws of the state of Texas. And we admit that it has its offices at this particular location, but we deny all remaining allegations. It's usually safer to um, restate the admissions and then lump it all the denials together. Because if you did accidentally omit um, a denial that you really meant to have, um, it's going to be lumped in with all the other denials. Oops. Let's just go a little bit farther here. Do a little bit more. Scroll down. I'm going to go to the facts section. Now, I don't really know what um, Frisco Independence position on these facts are, so I'm, I'm making guesses here that could be completely wrong. Okay, at the time that they were filing this answer, Mr. Jackson was still an employee, we'll say. So as I'm going through, and I'm the attorney for Frisco Independent School District, Alvin Jackson is a teacher at Frisco High School in the Frisco Independent School District. Okay, that is, we'll say, is a true statement at this point in time. Mr. Jackson is the only African American coach and core subject teacher at Frisco High School. Well, obviously, I'd want to research that. There's really two issues. Is he the only African American coach at the school at this time? So there's a few things I'm thinking about. First of all, is Mr. Jackson African American? Number one, number two, I'm going to want to research all the other coaches. Um, you know, obviously the term African American can have a variety of different meanings. Perhaps there is a, a coach who is biracial, who may have some African ancestry, but also some other ethnicities as well. Um, so that might be a situation that we end up concluding, well, no, we're going to deny that because there is a biracial uh, coach who has some African ancestry. Um, or perhaps there uh, might be, say, a coach who, whose ancestors are uh, Caucasian or um, Indian or um, Arab, but whose ancestors come from Africa. You could say, well, that person is an American with African ancestries, even though that person's ancestors 
uh, do not um, have uh, the ethnic features, the racial features associated with sub-Saharan African um, uh, residents. Uh, so again, uh, you, you're having to parse through every single bit of this. You don't assume, well, surely Mr. Jackson knows what his race is. If they're, you know, you don't, you don't want to deny something frivolously. Um, it seems probably very likely that Mr. Jackson is African American. Um, let's just pull him up. You'll, you'll be able to see that. Um, here we go. Okay, here we go. Mr. Jackson actually has a LinkedIn account. Um, so I'm going to go to his account here. We can see that he's a teacher in the independent, the Dallas Independent School District now. And yes, he certainly looks like his ancestry is African American. And so it would be pretty silly for us to dispute the fact that he is African American. Um, under those circumstances. But again, this claim that he's the only African American coach, we would definitely want to confirm that. Then also we'd want to consider what does it mean to be a, um, a core subject teacher? What is a core subject? What do we mean by that? Now I'm guessing it probably means English, math, science, and social studies. And so therefore if there were a core teacher or if there were a teacher who taught theater, or taught band, or taught um, uh, Spanish, um, those would not be core subjects. But because the term isn't defined in this document, um, it might be open to some uh, dispute. You could say uh, that especially if um, foreign language, for example, is required, um, or if you need to have some fine art course, so maybe band is a required not required that you have to take band, but you have to take some fine arts course, you could argue that maybe that's a core subject. So if you have an African-American teacher in those courses, then you might want to dispute that. Again, you're looking for reasons to dispute facts. Um, sometimes you're going to be given them, sometimes you're not. Um, in this case, though, probably we're going to be able to admit all of these facts. Most likely they're all true. On, let's go to the next paragraph. On April 18th, 2011. It's important to keep this in mind. There may be, the rest of this may be stuff that we have to admit to, but maybe we don't think it happened on this date or we don't know. Let's say Mr. Smith has lost his day planner for that date and he can't remember whether it was April 18th or April 19th or maybe it was even April 20th. Well, guess what? This gives us a basis to either admit or deny the date. Now, we can't at deny the whole event if Mr. Smith says, yep, that's pretty much what happened. But you don't want to fall into the trap of saying, well, this is what happened. Yeah, it probably was that date. No, you want to independently confirm the date. Okay, so on this date, did it really happen on this date? Kate Smith, and is this Kate Smith's title? Associate Principal of Frisco High School. Maybe his title is Assistant Principal of Frisco High School. Or maybe his title is, um, you know, a lead counselor or who knows what. We want to make sure this is actually his title um, on his business card, on his position description. Maybe um, he's just gotten a promotion and now he's um, the assistant principal at Wakeland High School or something. So um, things could have changed. It doesn't necessarily mean that when this document was prepared that Mr. Jackson was inaccurate, but facts change and so you want to make sure that you have the latest greatest news. So Cade Smith, Associate Principal of Frisco High School, and by the way is the name spelled correctly? Is that how Mr. Smith spells his name? You'd want to confirm that. So Cade Smith completed a professional development and appraisal system summative annual appraisal. Is that what we call this document at uh, Frisco High School? Uh, maybe it's called the Professional Development and Appraisal system annual appraisal, but this word isn't in it. Or maybe this word appears here instead of there. Again, you're going to want to deny it. 
Now, when you make a denial, do you have to say, oh, you know, and the, what you should have said is this. No, you just have to deny it, but you have to deny it as narrowly as you can. So what you would do is you would say, let's say this is the wrong name for it. You would say, Frisco Independent School District denies that the name of the document is Professional Development and Appraisal System Summative um, Annual Appraisal period. You don't have to say, and its real name is X. Uh -uh. You don't have to make, you don't have to do the work for the other guy. On Mr. Jackson, in this appraisal, Mr. Jackson was either proficient or exceeded his compliance in all areas. Um, again, you'd want to confirm that that is the case. So you go through each line. And as you're doing this project, what you're going to find is, oh, you know, I know this answer right off the bat. Yeah, that's true. I know this right off the bat is something we're going to deny. But there'll be some that you're going to be like, I don't know about this one. Are Sam Ryder and the superintendent close friends? Maybe they are. Maybe they're not. But that's something you'll want to research. Another interesting thing about that is, you know, how do you define close friends? Um, you know, uh, you know, obviously, if Sam Ryder and the superintendent um, live next door to each other and go fishing every Saturday morning and have lunch together at least three times a week, okay, they're close friends. Uh, but maybe their relationship isn't that close. And so, uh, you know, you, you, that's not a, a provable fact in the same way that you can prove that a meeting happened on a particular date because what one person defines as a close friend might not be consistent with how another person defines a close friend. And so um, that could be a situation where you might be able to deny something even when you're really not disputing the facts, but you, in your mind, there's a different terminology for close friends than what the plaintiff is saying. So hopefully you're getting the flavor about how you go about doing this um, so that you can see how involved this can be, how many different people you're going to have to talk to. Obviously, you're going to talk to Mr. Smith. He's probably going to be able to tell you about the composition of the students. You're going to, have to talk to Mr. Ryder. You're going to have to talk to the superintendent. Um, uh, you're going to have to uh, talk to um, you know, lots of other people to track down all of these particular facts to make sure that your information is accurate. Um, be careful when affirmatively admitting an allegation because a defendant may not introduce evidence at trial to contradict an admitted fact. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, so we've talked about how you handle all of the paragraphs that the, um, are in the complaint. But after you've completed the complaint, you're also going to do affirmative defenses. Before we do that, though, I want to do one thing here. I want to show you a couple of documents that I have located. So if we go to our course modules, and we go down here to Chapter 5, you'll see in the example pleading sections, first of all, we have the Jackson pleading, but we also have a, um, I'm going to reverse this order here. We have a complaint in the Pinnacle Pizza versus Little Caesar case, and we have the answer. I have these pulled up so you can get a sense as to the back and forth. I could not find the Jackson answer, um, so I chose to, to use this one. So let me go ahead and... So let's first of all look at the complaint. The first thing that you'll notice is that this is a second amended complaint. So this is the third time. First of all, there was original complaint, then a first amended complaint, and now there's a second amended complaint. Again, when you see the word amended, it means that we are replacing the, um, the previous document. So now that we are up to the second amended complaint, we don't care about the first amended complaint or the original complaint. This is the document that matters. Okay, and you can see again the paragraphs are numbered. In this jurisdiction, and keep in mind it's in South Dakota, things look a little different. You'll see some differences. For example, we don't do this box stuff. We don't put division in parentheses. Um, we don't do the numbers going down like this. There's gonna be some differences between one jurisdiction and another. 
doesn't make how they do it in South Dakota wrong or evil it just is different and so that's why you always want to use an example because if you were to file a document with this appearance in eastern district it's going to look weird is a judge going to bounce it probably not unless there's a local rule but you don't look like you fit in you're the the uh, the awkward nerdy kid who has a a, a a pocket protector in his in his shirt. Nobody's going to want to sit next to you in the lunchroom. Basically, is what I'm saying here. Um, similarly, if you were to take an Eastern District of Texas format and file it in the District for South Dakota, guess what? You would be the nerdy kid, and no one would want to have lunch with you under those circumstances. So, fit in is the the takeaway. Okay, so here's our first paragraph. These are the facts that um, are either going to be admitted or denied in the in the answer plaintiff is a corporation formed and operating under the laws of states of south dakota with its principal place of business and chief executive office in sioux falls south dakota and is therefore a citizen of the state of south dakota okay so that is our first uh, paragraph let's see what little caesars the defendant did with that and we can see paragraphs one through four they admitted all four okay so let's just go down to paragraph five because that's the first one that there's some differences on. So we're back in the complaint. The citizenship of plaintiff is entirely diverse from the citizenship of the defendants. And again, we have defendants. We have a Michigan corporation, a Michigan corporation, and a Michigan corporation. So we have three defendants here. So the citizenship of plaintiffs is entirely diverse from the citizenship of the defendants and the matter in controversy herein, okay, I would not recommend herein, it's not a best practice, exceeds 75,000 exclusive of interest and costs. So again, the basis for jurisdiction is going to be um, diversity. So let's see what little Caesar did with this in paragraph five. So here's our answer. Deny that the matter in controversy exceeds 75,000 exclusive of interest and costs. Admit the diversity of citizenship exists and deny knowledge or information sufficient to form a belief as to the citizenship of plaintiff. So you can see how they parse it. This admission and denial is about as long as the original paragraph. Actually, it's longer than the original paragraph. That's not unusual. Let's scroll ahead to where we get to the story. Actually, let me go back to the story. So let's get to where we actually have a story. So we're going to start the story in paragraph 13. Let's just read paragraph 13 and 14 so we get a flavor. Again, we're looking at the complaint. On or about June 1991, by the way, you don't put a comma here, you put a comma here. So this is a grammar problem. On or about June 1991, James Fisher and Mike Nichols formed Pinnacle Pizza Company Incorporated for the purposes of purchasing and operating a number of Little Caesars pizza franchises in South Dakota. On June 7, 1991, plaintiff through Fisher and Nichols entered into a franchise agreement with LCE, a copy of which is attached here to as Exhibit 1. The terms of the agreement were written solely by LCE and its agents. The franchise agreement is still in effect and plaintiff continues to operate as one of LCE's franchises. So we have two paragraphs. Let's see what um, Little Caesar did with those, with paragraphs 13 and 14. So we're going to scroll down to 13. Deny knowledge or information sufficient to form a belief as to the truth. So they're saying, we don't know, so we're denying it. Let's go back and look. On or about June 19th, James Fisher and Mike Nichols formed Pinnacle Pizza Company Incorporated for the purpose of purchasing and operating a number of Little Caesars pizza franchises in South Dakota. Now, my guess is Little Caesars, when it read that, goes, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, it was about that time, sure. And yeah, that's why we think they formed that corporation, sure. And yeah, we were already in talks with them, and we pretty much knew they wanted a Little Caesars at that time. So while they're denying it, very likely as the case progresses, they're going to get to the point, yeah, that sounds about right. We don't have any facts that contradict it. So the fact that they're denying it doesn't mean, oh, James and Mike are lying here. Actually, the corporation was founded in May. And no, that's not the name of the corporation, not Pinnacle Pizza Company Incorporated. It's 
Pinnacle Pizza Incorporated. There's no company in it. And, you know, the point I'm trying to make is that you can deny things that you're seeing back there thinking, that's probably all true, but we just don't know for sure. It's okay to deny under those circumstances. Okay, so now we're going to go on and we're going to look at entering into this franchise agreement and the terms were written solely by Little Caesars and it's still in effect and plaintiff is still operating as a franchise. So again, if you are Little Caesars, you're going through each one of these allegations. Let's see. Admit, except further state that while the text of the agreement was written by defendants, plaintiff had an opportunity to negotiate the terms of the text. Now these are our allegations that Little Caesars would know. I mean, obviously Little Caesars, if they're entering into an agreement with Fisher and, and Nichols, they had to know about it. And they have to be able to recognize the agreement they went into. And they have to, uh, you know, agree as to who wrote the terms. And they have to agree that it's still in effect. And that, so these are facts that are within in their area of knowledge. And so you can see how an admission is just going to have, have to happen under those circumstances. But I like that even though it's not really disputing anything, they go on to say, well, but yeah, maybe we wrote the thing, but it wasn't like the plaintiff didn't have the opportunity to negotiate. They didn't like something. And all they had to say was, we want to change paragraph 47, and then we could have negotiated about it. Anyway, so hopefully this is giving you a sense as to how these paragraphs go through. And as we go further, you can see most of the paragraphs, many of the paragraphs, there's going to be some admissions and some denials. That's pretty, pretty common. Okay, so let's go back to our PowerPoint. And now we're ready for a discussion about affirmative defenses. So this is not going to marry up with the complaint because there are no affirmative defenses in complaint. Let's first of all talk about what an affirmative defense is. An affirmative defense, first of all, well, you know, it's a defense. No big surprise there. It's when the defendant is saying, you know what, we're going to stop talking about the facts of the case for a second. Uh, you know, most likely the defendant says, you know, we're going to win on the facts. Sure, that's, that's, that's going to happen. But we also, even if we don't win the facts, we have another way of winning. And that is, these are these affirmative defenses. What is an affirmative defense? It's a defense based upon facts in addition to those alleged by the plaintiff in the complaint and that if proved by the defendant denies recovery to the plaintiff. So these are additional facts. Um, for example, statute of limitations. Um, let's say it was a car accident case. Um, uh, going back to the scenario, uh, Bob is stopped at the red light. I run into him because I'm on my phone. I decide to sue Bob. I wait 10 years before I file the lawsuit. Well, Bob is first of all going to um, deny any misstatements of fact that I have in my lawsuit. But he's also going to say, you know what, even if Gruber can persuade the jury that somehow or another she's entitled to recovery, she doesn't get to because the statutory period has expired for a tort claim under these facts. So these are examples of affirmative defenses. Let's look at the list, which is in Rule 8. And as you can see, it's a lengthy list. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, accord and satisfaction, arbitration and award, assumption of risk, contributory negligence. That's rarely a winning claim these days. Duress, estoppel, failure of consideration, fraud, illegality, injury by fellow servant. Uh, you know, yes, sometimes these will be alleged. They're, they're not that common. I would say latches is pretty common. Um, statute of frauds, possibly, statute of limitations. Um, those are probably the more common ones to actually um, be affirmative defenses. You'll see, though, people usually do <laughs> plead some affirmative defenses. You're not supposed to plead affirmative defense unless you have some factual basis for it. But I'll be honest, people kind of do have their boilerplate affirmative defenses, and they kind of roll it out. Um, and assert it even if maybe they haven't done a lot of independent thought about those, or at least some less responsible litigators do that. 
if you forget to raise an affirmative defense, you're going to waive it. And so that's one of the reasons why you tend to err on the side of inclusion rather than leaving it out. Because if, if it ends up, oh, wow, I didn't think, I didn't think we had a statutory statute of limitations issue. Well, we did. Oh, well, we didn't plead it soon enough. It's fine to plead inconsistent affirmative defenses and also affirmative defenses that are inconsistent with other parts of your um, uh, answer. So here's an example of an affirmative defense. Again, you're likely to have a section labeled affirmative defenses. So Bandit is not liable to plaintiff because the statute of limitation bars justice's claim. Okay, now this may not, I'll be honest with you, I don't really like it when you mix plaintiff and justice. Justice is plaintiff. I think it's good to just keep the same name all the time. It's fine to have plaintiff here and plaintiff here. If you're going to use plaintiff, though, you should use defendant here. So I think a better practice would be to have justice here instead of plaintiff. So bandit is not liable to justice because the statute of limitation bars justice's claim. Now many people would end it there. You don't have to make legal argumentation at this point. Um, as I say, many times you're kind of throwing these up here, not really knowing whether they have any teeth or not. In this case, though, this is a very well thought out affirmative defense. The automobile accident issue occurred on this date. Under Texas law, a two-year statute limitations period applies to negligence claims. Gosh, we've even signed the statute is how awesome we are. Um, plaintiff filed this lawsuit on this date. You, know, you can see the math, it's more than two years. So that's a very well pled affirmative defense. And you can see, you can, you can list additional ones, proportionate responsibility. This is instead of uh, contributory negligence, by the way, this is the comparative negligence alternative. Um, and again, you can add into your answer the uh, 12B motions or other Rule 12 motions. Again, you can file those separately, but you can also include them in your answer. Okay, let's pause and let's look at what we have going on in the Little Caesars. Um, I'm sorry, I have... Oh, here we go, affirmative defenses. The second affirmative complaint, excuse me, the second amended complaint fa fails to state any claims upon which relief can be granted. Okay, sure you immediately saw this and recognize this as a, a 12B6, right? 12B6. It's not really an affirmative defense, but I guess it's lumped with other defenses. Defendants deny that plaintiff has sustained any damage, deny the nature and extent of damages, if any, and deny they caused plaintiff to sustain any damage. And you'll see going through these, there may not really at the end of the day be factual support. They're saying that there's a statute of limitations problem. My guess is this is boilerplate, that there really isn't a statute of limitations problem. Uh, pretty common to just stick that in there, to be honest with you. Oops, wait a second. And again, going through this, you can see lots of affirmative defenses. The number of those affirmative defenses that actually have teeth, probably not too many. This gives you probably a little bit more realistic view about how affirmative uh, defenses are pled. The example that I have here is, uh, you know, where we have this detailed recitation of the law. Yeah, I mean, if you've got it, sure, you're going to use it. Um, this is, a, I mean, if this, these facts are true, and obviously they have to be true, you can put them in your lawsuit. Um, you've got a smoke affirmative defense here, but most of the time, you're not going to have such a smoking affirmative defense, because if you did, the lawsuit wouldn't have been filed, because it's a loser lawsuit. So, um, most of the time, you're sticking in kind of boilerplate affirmative defenses, not really knowing if they're going to go anywhere. Okay, again, you can have that section with 12, uh, 12 B defenses, or you can have it as part of your other defenses, as we said before. And then we're going to have a prayer here. For these reasons, and again, the old-fashioned way would have been wherefore premises considered, but this might be a better way. For these reasons, Bandit asks the courts to enter a judgment that justice take nothing, dismiss justice's suit with prejudice. Again, prejudice, we, we like that. We want to have the lawsuit dismissed and we don't want to face it again. 
It's probably not necessarily realistic that's going to happen, but hey, ask for it. Maybe you'll get it. If you don't get it, you're not, if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. Assess costs against justice and award any other relief the court deems appropriate. Again, this is a pretty standard prayer. You're probably going to, when you're writing your prayer for relief, just cut and paste uh, from another uh, answer that you, you like and obviously tweak the language so it's appropriate. We already discussed about dismissal with prejudice and dismissal without prejudice. If it's with prejudice, it can be refiled. If it's without, I mean, we cannot be refiled. If it's without prejudice, it can be refiled. Really important. A dismissal without prejudice is kind of no big deal. A dismissal with prejudice means game over. It may be appealed, but if the, the judgment of the court is upheld, game over. So here's an example when you have that 12B defense inside. So we're adding yet another element. And again, you wouldn't put it in red, you'd have it in normal black print. And we're up to the signature block. Again, the signature block is going to be uh, basically identical. Obviously, the attorney's name and information is going to be different, but it's going to be identical in format to the same one that we filed in a complaint. You're going to have respectfully submitted. You're going to have the name of the law firm. It can be here. It can be down here. You're going to have a line for the person to sign. Again, if your electronic signature is going to be at backslash s backslash. You have the name of the lead attorney his or her bar number, any other attorneys, their bar numbers, the physical location of the office, mailing address, the telephone number, the fax, the email address, and again, who he is or she is an attorney for. This is again how you do the e-filing if you're actually filing it in the Eastern District. So this is our first certificate of service that we have seen. Before we do this though, let me just show you um, the, uh, the signature block and the um, prayer for relief in the answer. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to scroll down. This particular answer also has a counterclaim. We haven't talked about counterclaims yet, so I'm going to scroll ahead to the end. Because it's a counterclaim, there's going to be some additional things. So here, wherefore, based upon the foregoing, and then this is the uh, prayer for relief. And again, because there's a counterclaim, there's going to be some uh, a request for awards based upon the counterclaim. That's why we have these two statements here. There is a jury demand. Um, I think that in the original complaint, there was also a jury demand. Let's see here. Let me scroll to the bottom. Yes demands a jury on all issues so triable. Uh, so you may say, well, why would little Caesar make a jury demand? Probably they're doing it so they can get a jury demand on their counterclaim. Um, that's the, yeah, and that, that they state that it's because of the counterclaim. And then here we have the signature block. You can see this is probably a matter of, of local difference. Um, they don't actually say respectfully submitted. They do have the electronic filing here. Uh, they aren't listing bar numbers difference here. Uh, we can see that they do list the mail address. They do list a telephone number. They are not listing an, an uh, facsimile number. Let's talk for a second about what Pro Hoc Vice is. Um, this is a, a kind of a good exercise to talk about it. You can see that Mr. Welk and Ms. Marzo are actually the local attorneys. They practice in Sioux Falls. But we can see Mr. Pressman and Mr. Kravitz are located in Boston. This probably means that Little Caesars, these are Little Caesars' usual law firm. Uh, Nixon Peabody is a well-regarded uh, law firm in Boston. And so Little Caesars usually uses them. But guess what? Um, Little Caesars has uh, restaurants all over the country. And so therefore, uh, they need to go out and litigate in these various locations. Uh, obviously, Mr. Pressman isn't going to be able to be admitted to every federal court in every single jurisdiction. And um, even if he chooses to go ahead and get admitted to that particular federal court, 
um, he's not going to have time before the answer is due. After all, you only have 21 days. So um, he is not going to be able to litigate this case alone. He's going to have to find an attorney who is already admitted to practice in this particular court. He needs to do that because since he's not admitted, he is not really considered an attorney at this point. And so if you were to file the document not being admitted, then um, that is um, a serious ethical violation on his part. So he's going to associate with that other law firm. And once he associates, Mr. Welk is going to, and Ms. Marzo are going to file a motion to allow Mr. Pressman and Mr. Kravitz to appear in this, dis, uh, in this dispute as attorneys for Little Caesars based upon this Pro Hoc Vice motion. And so this is going to allow them to practice despite the fact that they haven't been admitted to this court. Um, uh, courts traditionally do allow people to practice occasionally in their courts under these circumstances. They always have to have local counsel. Local counsel typically has to be present whenever they are in court and has to review anything that is filed in the matter. Um, if Mr. Pressman and Mr. Kravis routinely appear in front of the uh, federal court in Sa South Dakota, there is just one apparently. So uh, eventually, because every time they appear, they're going to have to tell the court, this is how many cases we've appeared in. These are the particular cases. At some point, the, the court is going to say, you know what, Mr. Pressman, you are constantly participating in inactivity in this particular federal court. You need to become a member of it. If it's just occasional, that's okay. But if it's a regular part of your practice, you need to become a member. So it's not something you can do forever, but you can do it for a little while. Um, but even if Mr. Pressman and Mr. Kravitz weren't required, let's say for whatever reason, Mr. Pressman happened to already be a member of this court um, if, because of some matter 10 years ago. And um, it used to be that if you became a member of a federal court, you could kind of be a member of that court forever without paying any additional fees. That's not always the case anymore. But let's say that is the case there. And Mr. Pressman is still a member. Well, then he would not have to file Pro Hoc Vice and he would not need local counsel, but he still very possibly would choose to have local counsel because guess what? You don't want to be hometowned. Um, he's a, a big fancy uh, attorney from Boston. He doesn't know how things are done in South Dakota. Um, Sioux Falls is not a huge town. Probably uh, the bar there knows everybody. Um, the, the members of the bar is probably a very collegial environment. The, the federal judges probably know Mr. Welk and Ms. Marzo. Um, they're not going to know Mr. Pressman, Pressman. And even if they've heard of him, uh, they're going to see him as a bit of an outsider. And so having one of the locals in on the litigation um, increases the credibility and also helps um, Mr. Pressman know how things are done. You know, if Mr. Pressman becomes, starts being too aggressive, um, Mr. Well can say, you know what, we don't really do it quite that way here. Let, let's try a different approach. Or if Mr. Pressman uh, is maybe not being aggressive enough, he can kind of let uh, uh, know how things are done in this particular place. So it's smart to have local uh, counsels, what this called. They were called local counsel in these circumstances. Okay, now we have our first certificate of service. Um, this is an example of an electronic certificate of service, and let me show you how it's, it's phrased here, at least to give you a flavor. I, Lisa Hansen Marzo, and you can see she's one of the attorneys right here, hereby certify that I'm a member of the law firm of Boyce, Greenfield, Pashby, and Welk, right here. She's saying she's a member, which means she's a partner. And then on the 16th day of October, 2006, I electronically filed the foregoing defendant's answer, this is the name of the document, to second commended plate with the clerk of, and, and this is kind of unfortunate because this is not actually the name of the document. Let's go look and see what the real name of the document is. Defendant's answer and counterclaim in response to second amended complaint. So not a big deal, but that just shows an example of a little bit of sloppiness. So the foregoing defendant's answer, and it should be and counterclaim, with the clerk of court using the CMECF system, which is the electronic filing system, which will automatically send email notification of such filings to the following attorneys. And these are the attorneys of record 
for Pinnacle Pizza. Let's just find it. We have Stephen Sanford, Stephen London, and Sean Landon and Sean Nichols. Let's go back and see. Oops. Scroll to the end. Ah, uh, here we go. Stephen Sanford, Stephen Landon, and Sean Nichols. Exactly what we were expecting to see. And it has their address. Again, they're not actually sending it to this address. They're letting the um, the um, uh, electronic system actually send the emails and again you can see that she has electronically uh, served this through that system so she really doesn't have to do anything this is more of an artifact of the system where you actually were uh, sending a courier down to the courthouse to actually file it, and then you actually would send these out return receipt requested Let's look at what the rules are with respect to um, serving these types of documents. Actually, let's, let's look at what the PowerPoint says first. So what is a certificate of service? It's a notice at the end of the pleading, so it's after the signature block, indicating, and again, not, but we don't use this for the complaint because we're going to have to serve the complaint. So we don't use a certificate of service, but any other pleading after that original complaint, we're going to be using a certificate of service. And we're not going to use it just for pleadings, but we're going to use it for motions and other documents as well. So it is a notice at the end of a court document indicating that service of the pleading or court document has been made upon a particular party. So we're going to look at the Federal Civil Procedure 5 for the detail. When filing an answer or any other document with the court, the defendant must send, again we're going to say serve, a true and correct copy of that document to all attorneys of record and any unrepresented parties who have appeared in the lawsuit. So we can do, it. if there's paper filing, um, the, the copy of the answer must be sent to all of those parties. Uh, very common to send it certified mail return receipt requested, uh, but there can be some other ways that are sent depending upon the local rules. If you're using an e-filing system, again, the system is going to automatically send those, but you want to make sure that the local rules are complied with. So let's look at the local, or let's first of all look at the Federal Rule of Civil Procedure for number five, rule five. Service, how many? Serving an attorney. If a party is represented by an attorney, service under this rule must be made on the attorney unless the court orders service on the party. Service in general. A paper is served under this rule by handing it to the person, leaving it in the office, mailing it to the person's last known address, leaving it with the court clerk if the person has no known address, or sending it by electronic means if the person has consented in writing, or delivering by any other means that the person consented to in writing. Okay, so let's look at the local rules. So we're going to go to Rule 5. And you can see there's going to be a lot about Local Rule 5. Here. Electronic filing required, except it's expressly provided or in exceptional circumstances permitting a filing user for filing electronically. All documents filed with the court shall be electronically filed in compliance with the following procedures. So you have to file electronically. Let's see if they have something about the way the certificate of service ought to be worded. Oh, here, certificates of service. The certificate of service required by Federal Civil Procedure 5D, let's just go back and look at 5D. Filing, require, required filing certificate of service. Any paper after the complaint that is required to be served together with certificate of service must be filed within a reasonable time after service. But disclosures under this particular rule and the following discovery requests and responses must not be filed unless they are used in the proceeding or the court orders filing. So basically this rule is saying you have to have a certificate of service. Now we're going to see, um, so going back here, this is where we are. The certificate of service required by this rule shall indicate the date and method of service. In civil cases involving filed sealed documents, counsel must indicate the sealed documents 
was were properly served by means other than the electronic system. So as you can see here, um, because, what's our wrong one? Is it really, Miss Marza didn't have to do anything when she filed the answer it auto, she said the system automatically did this other task, but we still have to have the certificate of service because rule five requires it. Okay, the document that is being filed must contain the certificate of service signed by the attorney, not the paralegal, uh, filing the document that a true and correct copy of the document was submitted to all their attorneys of record. So what does the certificate have to say? I want to flag this because uh, many of our assignments do require a certificate of service and this is fairly common that something is missed. Who was served? And usually you're going to include, especially if you're doing it in paper format, you're going to include the address. The date of service. Again, if you're doing it in a paper format, you usually have a line and the person actually writes, you know, the 15th day of the month or whatever. Um, since you're going to be electronically filing stuff, usually you're actually going to then type the date in. But this is the one that is oftentimes missed, again, if you're actually filing it uh, not through the electronic service. It's the method of service. You can't just say it was served. You have to say how it was served. Was it hand-delivered? Was it emailed? Was it sent certified mail return receipt requested? The rules require that. So keep that in mind. That's an important requirement. And again, here is an example of um, how you might have a certificate of service. I certify that a true and correct copy of the foregoing document was served via email and was also electronically filed on this date through the this system. Again, most federal courts use this system. It's the electronic filing system, which will automatically serve a notice of electronic filing upon the following attorney in charge of plaintiff butte for T justice. And again, here is that information about that person. And this seems like a little bit of overkill to include email. And I guess, well, since we're sending it by email too, that wouldn't be unreasonable. This would be not as common to list. And again, you have to have that, that signature here. Usually we don't need a verification. That's pretty unusual. Um, but if you do need one, obviously you're going to include it. Here's an example of one. A verification obviously needs to be notarized. And the attorney or the paralegal isn't going to be able to sign here. It's going to be someone who has personal knowledge of the facts. The paralegal, though, may be the notary who actually notarizes the signature. So this is pretty common. Again, it could be on a separate document or it could be at the end of the um, of the document. Okay, well we will stop here at this point and um, continue in another lecture with the rest of the presentation. Thank you for your attention. I, uh, at this point, we're, we're done with, with the uh, elements of the answer and we will go on and talk about uh, some other um, issues with respect to how we might proceed um, separate from the answer. So thank you for your attention.